Hi, I'm Dr. James Amos, Consulting Psychiatrist at University Hospitals in Iowa City, Iowa. And this is another Dirty Dozen Geezer video presentation, this time about the essentials of psychodynamic psychotherapy with an emphasis on time-limited dynamic therapy. Not that I know a whole lot about that, and because I'm a consulting psychiatrist, I really admit that I spend most of my time running all over the general hospital, putting out fires, uh, which is what most consulting psychiatrists do. We don't have time often for uh, an hour's worth of uh, sit-down psychotherapy with patients, but uh, it's very important that psychiatric trainees and psychiatrists know about psychotherapy because we're more than just about psychopharmacology and diagnostics. And I think it's also important to point out that uh, I will uh, be spending very little time on these slides. The dirty dozen uh, is just what it says. There are a dozen slides. and. You can view the full presentation online at my blog site, The Practical Psychosomaticist, uh, at jajsamos.wordpress.com. Uh, the resources that I used mainly for this, um, actually one resource, uh, is the Art and Science of Brief Psychotherapy as a Practitioner's Guide, edited by Mantash Dewan, Brett Steenbarger, and Roger Greenberg, with, of course, Glenn Gabbard as the series editor. This is the older version of the book. You want to get the 2012 edition. That's new. Um, another set of resources that are very useful and interesting to read are uh, a couple of books by George Vallant, uh, The Wisdom of the Ego, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, another by George Vallant is Adaptation Life, uh, another excellent resource. Um, the other one, of course, is Psychodynamic Psychiatry and Clinical Practice, uh, by Glenn Gabbard, by all means get the new edition. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, slides uh, I'll be going through as usual, just to make sure that I stay on track. Uh, we'll start with the uh, core beliefs of uh, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and um, I'll, I'll just read through a few of them. I, we feel and behave as we do for specific reasons. We're often unaware of why we feel and behave in certain ways. Past experiences, which are often outside our awareness, determine how we feel about ourselves, other people, and our world, as well as our future. The need to master psychological pain is very important, and it, it accounts in many ways for why most of us behave consistently and predictably, often in self-defeating ways. Uh, the power of the therapeutic relationship is predicated on a physician's ability to, uh, not just a physician, but a licensed psychotherapist, psychologist, or master's in social work, to provide a safe environment uh, for examining emotions and psychological problems in a non-judgmental and empathic way, which is really all about building rapport. So the past experiences of both the patient and the therapist play uh, important roles in determining the power and valence, positive or negative, uh, of the therapeutic relationship. So successful treatment must integrate both affective and cognitive components of patient self-awareness uh, and includes supportive as well as interpretive in interventions. Uh, slide four is uh, some more about essential assumptions uh, of psychodynamic psychotherapy. Uh, maladaptive relationship patterns are actually most of the time learned in the past and these maladaptive patterns are maintained in the present. Dysfunctional relationship patterns tend to be reenacted in the therapy milieu in vivo or in real time in the therapeutic session. Um, the therapeutic relationship therefore has a dyadic quality most of the time when it's between uh, patient and therapist of course and the therapeutic focus is on the chief problematic relationship pattern much of the time. Slide 5 uh, makes the point that behavior most of the time is not haphazard. Therapists ask the question, why is the patient expressing this topic now? Process communication, uh, which is complementary to content communication, involves listening for understanding which sounds simple, uh, but it's very important. Patients communicate, and we all communicate on multiple levels, and often we communicate indirectly. Uh, we use jokes, 
We uh, make revelations at the end of uh, therapy sessions. Uh, we often speak in metaphors um, and may suddenly shift the topic. So these things happen in therapy sessions and it's really important for therapists to become sensitive to those types of uh, occurrences and to learn to listen uh, to those. Again, uh, behavior is not haphazard. Resistance is really about uh, what is often viewed as a paradoxical phenomenon of ambivalence that all patients have about treatment. They come to treatment seeking help, but often in the end, yes, but therapists all over the place. And that's really not always purposeful. Uh, there's a tendency uh, for therapy to provoke subtle, covert, and sometimes overt op oppositional behavior that prevents deeper understanding of problems. Uh, this can range, uh, this type of behavior can range from missing appointments to jumping from one topic to another, uh, and it protects patients uh, against threatening feelings and fantasies. So if you look at it that way, if you look at resistance that way, it begins to make a little more sense. So this is a form of defense mechanism, and it's a way of relating to internal ex and external wor worlds in an attempt to avoid unpleasant and strong feelings. There are both adaptive and maladaptive defense mechanisms. Uh, defense mechanisms are not that difficult to understand, but it's important to realize that um, these are unconscious uh, maneuvers to avoid unpleasant emotions. Uh, the description of defenses or resistance, which amounts to the same thing, uh, rests on an adequate knowledge of what defenses are. And George Vallant referred to them, and uh, once again I'll recommend Adaptation to Life uh, and uh, The Wisdom of the Ego, um, important books for understanding these types of processes. Um, referred to them in one, uh, 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 referred to them one of the three different means by which people cope with threats. Now the other two being social supports and cognitive coping strategies. Defenses are largely involuntary regulatory coping processes. So they're unconscious distortions of inner and outer reality in the service of protecting us, or the ego, uh, from disorganizing anxiety and depression. Uh, they often strike other people as being odd, <clears throat> but are not invariably the product of diseased minds. Uh, they may also mature uh, over time. Confronting people with their defenses, and this is very important, uh, or over-eagerly interpreting them just because you find them and you're clever enough to, to recognize them, uh, doing that at inopportune times is almost always wrong. So learning to recognize them uh, in order to make sense of otherwise inexplicable uh, behaviors, inexplicable behaviors, and to make rough predictions about responses to therapy is helpful. And uh, slide eight is a uh, list, list a number of the uh, uh, defense mechanisms as examples, so we won't go through them here. Uh, slide 9 is about the past being present. Um, implicit memory and the need to avoid unpleasant and disruptive feelings uh, may explain why some traumatic experiences are not accessible to many people. And a word about transference and countertransference, uh, which can happen not just in therapy sessions, but in any clinical encounter. Uh, is responding to someone in the present as if that person were an important figure from the past. Uh, it's utilized in the therapeutic dyad for corrective experiences and encouraging more adaptive behavior as the patient gradually becomes more aware of this phenomenon. Uh, a word about self-defeating behavior. Uh, it's making the same mistake repeatedly, such as, uh, for example, marrying abusive alcoholic partners. Uh, you might understand this as an attempt to master enduring conflict or trauma in order to finally resolve the painful experience. It's a sort of maladaptive, quote-unquote, getting back in the saddle type of thing. 
Um, when awareness of this process is gained, one can end this vicious cycle. So remembering can then replace reliving. And the challenge of psychodynamic psychotherapy is to foster this dynamic. Slide 11 is about the essential operations of psychodynamic, psychodynamic psychotherapy. <clears throat> it's about accepting. Uh, the therapist affirms the past, present, and present subjective experience. It's about understanding. The therapist appreciates both the conscious and unconscious contributions to the patient's emotional problems. And it's about explaining. The therapist expresses very carefully through interpretations and when the patient is ready to hear them, his or her understanding about the patient's problems and how to move forward. So the last slide uh, will be references and uh, uh, this concludes the presentation about psychodynamic psychotherapy. It's a real quick run through and I really hope uh, experts like Glenn Gabbard and other psychodynamic psychotherapists understand that uh, this rough cut consulting psychiatric provider is doing the best that he can to provide therapeutic communication in his daily practice and to show the public and professionals his own opinion about how important it is to continue providing psychotherapy to patients, regardless of what systemic pressures are out there that tend to inhibit it. Thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed it.